start it? This meeting is being recorded. And um, let's go ahead and get started. We have a tight schedule. So um, welcome to the session 1H. My name is Cynthia Henry and I am the College of Human Sciences. Uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm the College of Human Sciences Librarian at Texas Tech University. And my pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm a member of the TCDL Planning Committee. I am pleased to be your session moderator today. So just some first some housekeeping. Um, we ask uh, Texas Digital Libraries and the uh, TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. So um, let me drop our policy here, our code of conduct. If you want to read some more, I just put some information in the chat. Today's meeting will run until about 3.50. Please feel free to um, take breaks as you need. We will first have a 15 minute presentation with a five minute Q&A, and then we will start the lightning talks um, with a single Q&A at the end of the lightning talks. I will be watching for your questions um, to share them with our speakers. Feel free to put them in the chat and then at the appropriate times you can um, mic during the Q&As and ask if you would like. Um, let me go ahead and, oh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Christina. Here is the code of conduct message. And uh, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen so that we can see the slides. And then um, uh, let me go ahead and get us started. So our first presentation is uh, Sprinting While Juggling, Learning Through Immersive um, Community GIS Skill Building with Joshua Bean, Christina Clouch, Jennifer Flagspark, Cynthia Henry, and uh, Sylvia Jones. Thank you, Cynthia. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. We have about 15 minutes of content to share as Cynthia indicated, and then she will help facilitate questions um, if you have some at the end. This is the story of how a nascent GIS interest group comprised of information professionals without an abundance of time, resources, or evenly matched GIS expertise came together while juggling myriad responsibilities with a twofold common purpose, to carve out time to learn more about GIS specifics relevant to their work and to nurture a sense of community. Today's story, a bit like a case study, will be told by a subset of the GIS interest group members who planned and participated in a learning event that was impactful in different ways for each person involved. In fact, you'll hear more about the impact of this effort from one of my co-presenters later on. And you'll see that our presentation, like the event as a whole, is inclusive and fueled by community. The GIS interest group is comprised of self-selecting librarians and research support experts from Texas Digital Library member institutions and beyond. If this sounds interesting to you, we encourage you to join us. Each year during TCDL, Birds of a Feather sessions are among the content-rich sessions and networking opportunities that make up the conference experience. The TDL GIS interest group evolved from GIS Birds of a Feather sessions, just like the one earlier this afternoon, and became an official TDL forum in 2020. Subcommittees were formed as the charter was crafted and the mentoring subcommittee was born. Four members strong, the subcommittee set about encouraging IG members to become mentors, mentees, or co-learners. The co-learner option garnered the most interest, and one of the subcommittee members, Cynthia Henry, coordinated a small group of co-learners. Over time, some challenges emerged. So our co-learner um, challenges were that we were all at different institutions. We really didn't know each other well. Some of us are a little bit shy, and we're all quite busy. 
we all had different learning skills, um, level of skills, I mean, and we had different things that we wanted to learn. But it really came down to is none of us really knew GIS so well that they, we felt like we were adding to the co-learning, that we were trying to just all begin learning. And so we had a lack of time and um, we were wary of making unsustainable time commitments. And um, once we did make some headway, a lot of times our priority related um, work, you know, the real job, if you will, um, got in the way. And so it was mounting frustration. So then that's when Jennifer Flaxbar suggested um, the sprint. And while I had heard about the agile method used by IT, I had not heard about the sprint. But the sprint's main goal is to focus on the assigned activity or task with the intention of creating a product or outcome of the highest possible value within a set time period. And so um, that really fit what we needed. Um, the sprint really was meeting a lot of the needs. It had a specific time set. It had daily meetings to nurture our culture of community, which we were really lacking. Um, it allowed us to have independent hands-on engagement with activities. Um, and uh, not only for the co-learners, but we could have others opt in to this collaborative experiential learning um, activity. So the co-learner need plus the sprint construction really came light to the GIS learning community sprint. Sylvia, you're still muted. I'm sorry. Okay. So after polling the broader interest group membership using Padlet, which is a polling software, the topic preferences were determined and narrowed down to fit a four-day schedule. And we selected a week in mid-July to have the event. We decided that this was going to be offered via Zoom. It was going to be a free learning opportunity on a first-come, first-served basis for members of the TD LGS interest, interest group and anyone who was interested. Okay. So the curriculum is there on the, on the slide. And then the planning was done by um, a nine person volunteer team made up of members of the interest group. And that group met weekly for six weeks leading up to the sprint. And the meetings were spent discussing logistical framework the order of the presentation, the contents, who the instructors were. We developed some learning um, outcomes, and then we decided that this was going to be like a, a modular curriculum for maximum flexibility. So three of the planning group committee members were instructors, and there on the screen, you can see which of those three members also served as instructors. So when we sent out the information about the about the event, we decided to include the learning outcomes that we had um, agreed upon. And these were to increase awareness of and context for GIS web-based applications and cloud-based geospatial tools. We wanted members to learn quick, easy ways to locate and utilize GIS resources and manage geospatial data in the cloud. We wanted the participants to make a web map to share information or augment the research outcomes, or even to tell a story using story maps. We hoped that um, members or the participants would all benefit from co-learning with other like-minded individuals. So there was a lot to pack in this four day and this, this um, slide here shows you all the different areas of focus. So, um, we were able to get through this all because what we did actually was mostly introductory such topics on these different areas here. Two of the three instructors had multiple areas of expertise, and so they taught multiple modules. I did the section on RGS Online, and I spent the time sh showing um, participants how to navigate, how to search for, and add layers and how to work with symbology. That was the first part of the session. The second part was we focused on story maps where we used, we built a story centered around the map that we had created that earlier that session. So that was a great way for us to integrate what we had learned earlier into the story map. 
Now I'll hand it over to my colleague who's going to talk about the other areas of focus. Hi, hey everyone. Uh, in addition to desktop, GIS software, and cloud platforms, we also demonstrated how numerous library subscription databases uh, that have mapping capabilities. These databases include Policy Map, Reference Solutions, which I will forever know as Reference USA, Simply Analytics, which I still sometimes refer to as Simply Map, and Social Explorer. Uh, these tools are the most accessible as little to no GIS training is necessary. Perhaps your library has access to these resources? Uh, you can see from uh, this list just how varied participation in our sprint was. Librarians from public universities, private universities, community colleges, and all over the state, 11 different institutions. The only imbalance were only three men and 11 women. What can you do? I will tell you that in my opinion, preparing the content as a sprint instructor is so much less complicated than organizing the sprint and ensuring that everyone interested can have a voice in the direction of the sprint, a means of communicating during the sprint, and a voice providing feedback afterwards. In order to facilitate this, we leveraged five tools. The first, Padlet, was used to vote on the direction of the sprint. Zoom was used to share and record the morning sessions. A Slack channel was created for our discussions. Multiple Google documents were used for scheduling, exercises, et cetera. And Google Forms was used to elicit input before and afterward as well. I want to take a brief moment just for a very small testimonial. I want to tell you just how much I and Baylor University benefited from this sprint. During that, and if you were in the session an hour ago, you would have heard some of this already. Uh, but during the same summer of 2021, our libraries were taking over administration of our campus ESRI or ESRI license. The training provided on ArcGIS Online during the sprint was absolutely invaluable. And I sincerely want to thank Michael Shensky from UT and Sylvia Jones from SMU for providing this content during the sprint. Additionally, Due to the information that I and through me, uh, our team here at Baylor University learned from the sprint, we were able to partner with University of Pennsylvania to create an ArcGIS online dashboard to celebrate the recent birthday of W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, this sprint turned out to be absolutely wonderful for both myself and for Baylor University. So during each afternoon discussion session, uh, a link to an end of day survey was sent to all of the attendees. These were brief surveys, but the results were tabulated immediately and shared with the instructors and the planning committee. Uh, sometimes the next day content or approaches were modified based on the input that was received so that we could improve for the next day, whatever people were having trouble with. Um, also any accolades that were given were also shared with the instructors at that time. Um, the daily survey feedback, along with the input received through the final survey, created a comprehensive overview of what worked well, along with suggestions for improvement, which was very helpful, especially for our planning this, this semester, this summer. And as hope, the pilot sprint helped the mentoring subcommittee and the broader GIS interest group membership grow and evolve in understanding and skill towards the GIS research and tools. So many of us learned so much. Um, just in that short week. <laughs> Most participants attended all the synchronous sessions, and many were able to complete some or all of the independent exercises that were given to help um, cement those learning sessions. The curriculum materials developed by the instructors remained available to all the participants on Google Drive. A readme file and a Google form accompany the folder so that as sprint participants revisit the materials for use, reuse, whatever they want to do, we can track what provides value over time. The modular approach to instruction ensures that later reproductions of this pilot can mix and match existing and new modules, new lessons. Uh, lessons can be standalone or stacked to advance the skills beyond the foundational level. And the sprint can be longer, shorter, or differently paced. This semester, this summer, we're going to have a mini sprint, so it'll be a little shorter. The next steps for the TDL GIS community uh, will be to identify topics for new modules, repeat offerings for new group members, which I hope might be some of you, uh, 
encourage existing pilot participants to take on instructor roles, and remind participants that they can repurpose the modules for local use in training researchers and colleagues. Planning for a mini sprint in the summer is 2022 is already underway. And this time it's gonna be led by our GISIG events subcommittee rather than the mentoring. In the chat, we're gonna hopefully be able to put in a link to see this event and our listserv. So if you wanna learn about the event and get updates on it, join our listserv. And that way you'll get the emails about it um, to receive any communications on the mini sprint. The end of this story is that we sprinted while juggling all the things we learned. And then we were on to what was next feeling like winners with more skills, resources, and a supportive village of colleagues. Thank you for listening and for um, watch for the announcements about joining us for the 2022 GIS mini sprint. Then are there any questions that have come in the chat or that anybody has at this time? I don't have any in the chat. Um, does anybody have any? We're getting some clapping. That's nice. Oh, somebody has their hand up. Bruce, do you have a question? Go ahead. So I do. Great talk from everybody. And I really want to congratulate you because GIS is not easy. Um, so I'm a geoscientist. Most of you know I'm not a real librarian. And I was actually present when um, ArcGIS was established and created in uh, by grad students downstairs back in the uh, 80s, really fun. So I only have one question. There are many, many ways to represent data, scientific data, right? Uh, and geospatial representations in maps is just one of them. So why should libraries preference um, building skills and programs around GIS data? And I have a good answer, but I'd love to hear what you guys think. I would answer. Uh, this is Josh Ben, everybody. Uh, I, yeah, Josh. I, I would answer that um, that I think it is uh, for for many libraries. It, it, the library has taken on a responsibility for are working with researchers in uh, data. And that will include not only accessing data, but also uh, working with the data, including visualizing and analyzing it. Uh, we do support that here at Baylor Libraries. And uh, that analysis and visualization may include mapping and geospatial. It may not include mapping and geospatial. I think it. it from my point of view, it's important because there's a whole industry uh, around GIS and mapping that uh, if you want to support uh, data and data science and data analytics, you cannot avoid mapping, right? It's just one component. Uh, so that's why within our uh, data and digital scholarship services, GIS is one component alongside of data visualization, text data mining, research data management, it's all under that same umbrella. And so that's how, that, that, that's what I, what I would argue that GIS is, uh, it's pretty important and essential because how could you avoid mapping from humanities to sciences to social sciences? Everybody's wanting to, uh, everybody's working with geospatially referenced data. That's off the top of my head, but that's my thoughts. <laughs> Great. Um, we did have a question in the chat that I think is a good one. Um, the question is, how many sprints have we had in total? And how uh, and over how many months have you had the sprints? And uh, this is really, we were just talking about our first sprint. And so we're going to have our second sprint this summer. And it's going to be a mini sprint. Um, but so we've only done one. <laughs> so, so anybody want to add anything else? We have like maybe one or two minutes. And it was just a four-day event, really. It's not, it was not even stretched over a month. It was just a four-day event. I'll say that it took a lot of planning to condense all of that content. And then on the part of each participant, and in particularly the instructors, um, 
there was a lot of immersive deep dive focus given to that content and just the exchange um, that occurred as a part of the sprint. And that's part of what developed the community, which is incredible and has been so beneficial in many ways. Um, so doing more than one sprint, um, even within a given summer, is probably not feasible. And this year, based on the feedback, it's going to be a more um, condensed timeline. It's going to be a mini sprint. So I hope that answers your question. And if we didn't touch on something that you wanted to hear, let us know. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks again, um, speakers. That was great. And we're going to start our lightning talks now. Let me get our slides up and get ourselves started. Um, and um, so our first presentation will be the lessons my sheep have taught me about working with faculty. And that's from Bruce Herbert. <laughs> this is too funny. <clears throat> you good, Cynthia? OK, outstanding. So uh, as many people in TDL know, um, I am not a real librarian. I'm a geoscience faculty member that was recruited to serve as the director of scholarly communications at Texas A&M University. And I will tell you, my time uh, is coming to an end. As many of you know, things are changing at A&M. And so um, I just wanted to leave one message to TDL community. And, and it's real simple, um, advance, or am I advancing, Cynthia? I have no idea. Great. Um, <clears throat> first off, librarians have really, really important and, in, and deep understanding of a very, very crucial type of expertise that is not represented well on campus outside of the library. And that is around information management. And so, Many people need this help on campus and, and you really need to share it well. But in order to do that, uh, one of the things that I've seen, go Cynthia, is that um, you, need to, you need to form um, partnerships with uh, faculty on campus. It's not a service relationship. The reason is because faculty are not, um, they don't respond well to service relationships. They respond, they are goal-directed agents and they only respect partnerships. And so the thing about faculty though, is they really have diverse, um, they're really diverse and they have diverse needs. These are lambs that were just born this uh, last month. Go Cynthia. One more. Great. Um, also, you got to nope, go back uh, if you can, but if you can't, great. The, the one, uh, another thing that I need you guys to understand is that um, faculty can be really pushy. <laughs> there, this is House Lamb. House Lamb was a bottle fed baby. She used to sit on the couch with me and watch Dallas Cowboys football. I don't know why, but, uh, but boy, does she often um, push her way in and say, hey, I want to be fed. Faculty are exactly the same way. And the thing is, you need to respond to faculty the same way I respond to House Lamb. I just hit her on the nose and just say, get away, House Lamb. Okay, go ahead, Cynthia. Great. Um, faculty really respond to setting boundaries. Don't try to serve everything that they ask for. You decide what you want to do because it's a partnership. It is not a service relationship. This is a very, very, very famous sheep. It's called the DH uh, sheep from Switzerland. And uh, this sheep was really obnoxious. Well, you know what? A lot of faculty are really obnoxious too. And, uh, and so set boundaries, decide what you're gonna do, establish partnerships, and because you know something that is very, very valuable. Go, Cynthia. <coughs> Good. And so um, besides sheep, of course. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so, 10 seconds. Besides faculty. <coughs> 
other partners are really good on campus. And so set partners up to cause good things because you know unique and significant uh, things around information management. It's really, really good. Uh, this is a great dog. She died, it's very sad, but uh, great picture. <laughs> Thanks. So thank you. <laughs> and I just, <coughs> I just wanted to say it's been a pleasure working with the TDL community more than you guys can imagine. You're very, very smart. You know great things. And uh, I wish your campuses appreciated you more. So thank you. Okay, our next um, presentation will be um, getting to know your results from the Texas Data Repository User Survey. Christina and Chan Park, Sarah, uh, I'm sorry, Laura Sayer and Laura Waugh will be speaking. So good afternoon. Um, the three of us presenting today are myself, Christina Chan Park, the STEM Librarian Coordinator at Baylor University, Laura Sayre, Government Information and Data Librarian at Texas A&M, and Laura Waugh, Digital Collections Librarian at Texas State University. We are presenting a summary of a user survey for the Texas Data Repository. <clears throat> the Texas Data Repository, or TDR, contains data sets created by faculty, staff, and students at nine Texas um, higher education institutions. Um, can you go back, please? No, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, <clears throat> the TDR conducted a survey in spring 2022 in order to find out who uses the TDR, why they use the TDR, how they use the TDR, and what best RDM practices, what best RDM practices they follow. Next, please. For the purposes of getting feedback to the steering committee as they plan for training, outreach, platform development, policy, and help with our directions moving forward. Next, please. The survey was sent to 1,027 users on February 1st, 2022. Reminders were sent on February 22nd and March 10th. The survey closed on March 22nd. There were 123 respondents using a 12% response rate. Response rates for individual TDR institutions ranged from 10 to 22%. Next, please. Um, out of the 123 respondents, 44% were faculty members, 23 were non-faculty researchers, and 12% graduate students, and 20% have another status, such as librarian. Next, please. 87 respondents answered how they heard about the TDR. Users mostly learned about TDR by word of mouth from librarians and colleagues. No one indicated that they learned about TDR from non-library campus offices, so this could be an area of outreach. Next, please. Faculty and grad students are the least likely to create an account uh, just to download data and the most likely to create data sets and collections. Non-faculty researchers and those with other statuses are more likely to download data. Next, please. Um, most of the respondents indicated that they created their account in anticipation of depositing data. Others created accounts in order to download data or for training and or learning purposes. Next, please. Okay, and um, a, a pleasant surprise we found is that most respondents deposited their data as a best practice to support open science and scholarship. And in the comments, uh, several respondents also noted data preservation as a motivating factor. Next. Please. Most respondents noted that TDR being free to use for researchers was a big motivating factor and also the convenience of it. No one in, oh yeah, no one indicated they'd identified TDR through the R, the RE3 data registry, but several comments mentioned that they did choose TDR because it's supported by their institution. Most respondents organized depositing their data after the project is completed or when submitting for publication. Um, it's most op often published or released when submitting after publication and after the research project is finished and complete. That was interesting. 
And of 93 respondents that had deposited data in TDR, most had mentioned that in their data management plan. Most others didn't write a data management plan or remember, or they weren't sure what a data management plan was. And next, um, most of the respondents that deposited data did include a README file, and that was a nice surprise, or other context document about the data. Of those that did not, it was mostly that they didn't find it necessary or didn't know that it was something to include. So the majority of users shared their DOI as part of a publication, followed by sharing with collaborators and other researchers who requested access to the data. For those who selected other, some manually added their DOI to Google Scholar, ORCID, their CV, or grant reports. Next. Most users got data from a DOI or a URL or by searching in the TDR itself. Those who selected other mentioned that it was sent to them by another researcher or a librarian. Over 60 respondents were able to use the data the way they wanted. And most of the no answers were because the data was not relevant to their needs. For those who selected other, they mentioned they were either testing, using the data as a model, or that the file they selected was corrupted. Here we asked about what new features users would like to see in the TDR. Some multiple choice answers included sensitive data or capacity for large data sets, but some suggestions included integration with specific software packages. Next. When asked if they would recommend the TDR, the majority of respondents said yes, both to deposit or to find data. Our key takeaways include faculty, researchers, and graduate students are our primary users. Having a free, easy to use repository was appreciated by researchers who recognize data management best practices. Our study also found some areas for improvement for handling larger and or sensitive data sets. Next. Thank you very much. Okay, our next um, presentation will be piloting open project for digital projects by Marcia McIntosh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As she, uh, Cynthia mentioned, I'm Marcia McIntosh. I work as a digital production librarian at the University of North Texas. And today I will give you a bird's eye view of the fine and foggier points of a highly customi customizable project management software we've been testing out called Open Project. Next slide. As a member of the University of North Texas Digital Projects Lab, one of my responsibilities is to help facilitate movement of digitization projects from start to finish. Um, for our two digital library systems, the UNT Digital Library and the Portal to Texas History. Each project goes through the high level steps of inventory, imaging, metadata, and final inventory. And we started a system to break down each of these individual sections uh, to give them a deadline so that each step would have an equitable amount of time to finish their tasks. Uh, granted, keeping track of this system is great for one or two projects, but it can get unwieldy when you're working with 40 plus of them in various states along a workflow and uh, having different deadlines throughout a month or a year, uh, not to mention the occasional rush project that may need to take priority. Um, so we decided to try out Open Project, which we discovered after a testing period has the capability of keeping track of those deadlines, as well as several other wonderful features. And that's just a widget on their website that shows all the different things Open Project can do or could do if you wanted to.
so, um, but first, uh, you may be asking what we were using before we tried Open Project. We had a combination of three main things, a giant whiteboard, an internal on-premises wiki, and the free version of Trello. Um, we also had an internal network folder that we used to hold project files. The three main trackers have their own limitations, uh, which is why we were using them all together. Um, some of those features, uh, pros and cons, include the where it was available, the location, um, how it could report, um, the number of available views it offered, and um, what kind of notifications it allowed, as well as the user interface. <laughs> um, so uh, what are the open project, project management possibilities? Well, we knew it could automate deadlines, uh, deadline updates, but we decided, that to give, we decided to give it a year long subscription to see if its features could meet our other desired needs. And here are just a few. Um, the first is the number of views you get. This is the view all projects page that allows you to scroll through the projects you've added like an expandable Excel table. Um, it, shows you the status, um, a brief description that you can add in, and when it was created. Inside of each project, you get an overview dashboard page that allows you to provide a description and then uh, customize what widgets you'd like. In this example, we have the tasks in this particular project in the work packages table, as well as the project status, but you can also add a Slack channel, a calendar, uh, have a news stream, all sorts of other things. Um, the specific tasks of each project, uh, yes, please play. Um, the specific tasks of each project can be categorized by assignee, um, the accountable party, the equipment type, priority, and deadline, among other options. And if you have a tasks that are related and you actually relate them together, when you change one, it will automatically update all the other ones, which was the feature we were very excited about. There is also a boards view that is similar to Trello, uh, but they have different options for how you set it up. So in this example, you can, um, whenever you move the card, it'll change the status of the work package, but you could also do one based on if you have projects within a, if you have projects within a big project, you can modify the sub projects within it. It has several different features um, that you can add and you can have more than one view for the same project. Another nice possible feature is the search and filter capabilities. Uh, if labeled, you can search by project, assignee, deadline, priority, status, among other things, including if it's open or closed. Um, granted, there are some challenges with open projects uh, on the superficial level. It's not as pretty as Trello. Um, the bare interface has some customizable options, but not nearly as many as Trello lets you do. Um, it also can be buggy. Occasionally you'll get an error when you try to do something you know it can do and it's a little frustrating. Um, and it's great at strengths. Um, the ability to customize can also be overwhelming. Um, it's not very intuitive. It, it has a bit of a learning curve for users and it's the kind of tool you'll want to fiddle around with after watching a few tutorials on the Open Project YouTube channel. Um, and you'll have to take up quite a bit of time to decide how you want to set it up. Additionally, during the trial phase, we needed to keep up with all the other three plus systems we had. So the collective amount of documentation, which was extensive before, still is, um, even though Open Project has the potential to centralize much of it. Um, but there are perks like their templating system, which lets you solidify all the tiny details you've decided for different kinds of projects. Uh, we do our templates based on the size of the project, like the number of items or tips it will create and um, make the deadlines in accordance with that approximate size. Uh, so this let us figure out, uh, this let us solidify each of those deadlines in a template that lets us just update it whenever we add a new project. Um, we also paused and examined what information we were collecting for each project and where we wanted it to be and how it should be formatted to help streamline the documentation in this trial period. Uh, this step help, uh, helped us reduce bouncing back and forth when information needed to be updated. 
So I have still have high hopes that Open Project can work as an automated system for documenting projects, tracking deadlines, assigning work to staff and students, as well as automating reports and keeping the lab on course with its duties. Um, so is Open Project a digital, library's day, a digital librarian's daydream? I'd say we're still working on that, um, but we, we like what we've seen so far and we're excited about the possibilities. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Okay, our next one is uh, breathing new life into Maverick Veterans Voices Using Oral History Metadata, metadata Synthesizer. And Yumi O'Hara will be speaking. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yumi O'Hara, and I am a digital publishing and repository librarian at the University of Texas, Arlington, UTA. And I'm currently leading digital publishing services. So our digital publishing services vision is to bring innovation uh, to publishing not only text format, but also multimedia, such as uh, interview materials, and to create new digital collections supporting diversity and inclusion uh, within the UTA community. So today I will talk about our interview project, Maverick Veteran Voice a Project using a OM system, which stands for Oral History Metadata Synchronizer System. Next slide, please. So the Maverick Veteran Voice Project was created to collect diverse voices uh, from the UTA veteran and to make their stories and the experience available online. So since UTA is ranked number one in the nation by military time for saving veterans, uh, this project is very important for our institution. And it's a joint project between the uh, history department and the library. However, when I joined uh, UTA libraries in 2019, I found that uh, Maverick Veteran Voice Project had been inactive since 2015. Next slide, please. Uh, Maverick Veteran Voice Project was first launched in the fall of 2012 to collect, share, and preserve the experience and the stories of uh, UTA veterans. A total of 19 interviews with veterans were conducted. In 2014, a website for the Maverick Veteran Voice Project was created, and those 19 interviews, transcriptions, and biographies were presented on the website. However, all of the interview materials or video interview were not accessible. Uh, between 2015 and 2019, the project remained inactive. Um, I was hired 2019 as a digital publishing and repository librarian. And I launched a tool for interview materials, which is called Home System, based on my experience at my previous institution. Um, at the same time, we hired GRA Joe Carpenter to organize the existing interviews and also to expand the Maverick Veteran Voice Collection. So Joe completed the OM process for all existing interview materials from the Maverick Veteran Voice Collection. So uh, all 19 video interviews are now accessible with OM system. So we are currently creating and editing a new interview to the Maverick Veteran Voice Collections. Next slide, please. And the OM system was developed by the University of Kentucky and it's an open source. The primary purpose for OM system is to empower users to more uh, effectively, uh, efficiently discover information in interview online. So using the OM system, the interview materials can be delivered with a corresponding time tag and the transcription of the interview. Um, the OM system allows the user to search through the video or audio interview user keyword and to be taken to the exact moment that the keyword is spoken. So it means that the user do not have to scroll through the hours of recording or papers of transcript before finding the topic they are interested in. 
So OOM system can enhance search and the discovery of information in online audio or video by connection, uh, text search of the synchronized transcription and uh, index. So we use OOM system for uh, not only Maverick Veteran Voice project, but also other publishing interview project. For example, the interview materials from the UTA libraries, COVID-19 pandemic archive collection. Next slide, please. So since Joe joined our team, the Maverick Veteran Voice Collection has been expanded to include a new interview. So Joe is in the uh, photograph uh, wearing blue shirts. So he is a veteran of the US Air Force and the Desert Storm. So he graduated from UTA in 2020 with his bachelor degree in history and minor in military history. So he will be completing his master degree in history in this summer. Then he will be a PhD program at the UTA. So Joe has made a huge commitment to the Maverick Veteran Voice Project, and he has been contributing to expanding this project. Next slide, please. So we have conducted and created new interviews. Uh, it has over 10 interviews, and those interview materials are ready to be added to the Maverick Veteran Voice Collection using the own viewers. So in this spring, in that last spring semester at our digital publishing unit, we had four internship students from the English department and the history department. And those uh, internship students had participated in the uh, workflow of the interview process, including the own process. So we have developed a relationship and promoted our library as a partner in expanding our Maverick Veteran Voice project across campus. Next slide, please. And the Maverick Veteran Voice project is a continuous project. Uh, also, we have built a strong relationship uh, with the history department. Joe and I were interviewed, and our story with the Maverick, uh, Maverick Veteran Voice Project has been published in the news at the Department of History. So collaboration and partnership can be powerful tool to increase our uh, probability of our services. Next slide, please. So this concludes my presentation. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Amy. That was really good. So we're coming right up on the edge of uh, our session being done, but we have a few minutes to do some question and answers. If anybody had a question over the lightning talks, I know there was a bit of chalk in the chat, um, but uh, I think all the questions, there was a specific question and I think it got answered. So does anybody have a question? Well, if nobody has a question, I'm gonna ask one of uh, uh, Marcia. Um, can you tell us how long that your project has been going on? Just a year you're gonna do a pilot and then y'all are gonna make a decision or, or you've made a decision? Um, we started, we officially subscribed in November, but we tried it out before we purchased. Um, and so it'll it'll last until November. And so we figure we're gonna give it the full run and then assess at that point. Thank you, okay. It, it's fascinating that now you're documenting in so many points. Now, when you made that point in the presentation, I was like, oh my goodness, I just added another one. Yeah, I was just like, if maybe we just did this one, like how would that go? We can't, we can't really do that, so. Right, sure. Does anybody else have a question for any of our speakers? We had such great, interesting presentations today. Okay, well, I see that. Oh, wait, here, Bruce, you wanna ask a question? Yeah, Marcia, I, this is Bruce Herbert from Texas A&M. Did you use your open project for, or could you use open project for a grant funded project at your university? Mm -hmm. Would it work? I am assuming yes. Um, I, it, like it, you can put whatever kind of project you want in there and break it into whatever pieces you like. So I would, I would say yes. What would be like a difference between a grant funded project versus like any other project? Thank you, yes. Um, and only that faculty care about grant funded projects. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, no pro, no difference at all. Yeah. 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 Totally. 
That's well, thank, awesome. Yeah. Thank you all, everybody, for coming. I, I don't want to hold anybody up, um, but uh, I'll sit here for a second if anybody wants to ask a question. Um, and I can't wait to see everybody tomorrow morning for our second day of TCDL. Thanks for the question. Yeah, sure.